My name is Lars Kruse. I uh, represent a company, Pragma. Uh, we have a booth out there, so, uh, so if you don't know who we are already, we are a consultancy bureau. We're located in Denmark. We are uh, doing cons continuous delivery coaching. So we're helping other companies set up their continuous delivery tool stacks. And that could include anything that's in that tool stack. And that would include Jenkins, obviously, in most occasions. Probably all of those who are here today would use Jenkins uh, as their automation platform. And we are supporting Jenkins. Uh, we have released more than 12 plugins for the Jenkins community on behalf of some of our clients, and some of them we have done ourselves. We are a partner with CloudBees, and we are also supporting the Jenkins uh, Enterprise uh, solution. So that's basically our, our main business, that we are helping people uh, feel safe on open source and Jenkins. Uh, I want to tell you a story. This was announced as, uh, as uh, pre-tested integrations uh, uh, using a branchy approach. Uh, I did this uh, presentation two years back uh, in the Jenkins uh, um, user event in Paris on ClearCase UCM. Uh, let me know how many of you know ClearCase and ClearCase UCM. How many of you are still using it? Yeah, see, that's it. <laughs> so I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take you through this uh, ClearCase UCM plugin. That's not what's what's on the agenda. But the thing is that uh, this uh, this plugin that I'm gonna present to you today and the strategy, it's in the aftermath of uh, of of this plugin. The, the ClearCase UCM plugin. The story. Of I lost. Uh, I'm back. Okay. The thing is that this plugin was developed as a, as a joint effort between a whole bunch of companies. It started out with Novo Nordisk, who make uh, uh, insulin and, and medical devices. They wanted something that was FDA compliant, and, uh, and, and they wouldn't trust the, the plugins that were in there. So, so we started out together with them and, and, and created a plugin that they, they could trust. Uh, later, Grundfos, who makes pumps and moves water all over the world, they uh, they joined uh, the party and they did actually the vast majority of, of 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 the of the funding in this. Later, Jaguar Land Rover came along and uh, they wanted to use it on uh, on uh, on Linux. And uh, Gonfas and Novo Nordisk at this point had only been using it on Windows, so they paid actually for a very comprehensive test suite, actually making sure that this was indeed compliant with Linux. I mean, the change itself was like, you know, just, you know, make sure I don't have any backslashes, and then, then it worked. And then we just needed a test suite that would actually verify that it actually worked. So they paid for that. Uh, Cintico and Pelagicor make other, made other contributions so that uh, the, the, the change set from ClickHase UZM is huge and monstrous. So what we did is that we did a washed version of it that would, that would resemble much more what you would expect to see from Git or Subversion. So that was a uh, that was a story about basically five companies collaborating without actually knowing very much about each other, but by the fact that they're all contributing into the same uh, into the same uh, um, plugin. So what we're trying to do is that we're trying to establish around these companies and a lot of other companies what we call the joint open source roadmap alliance, and uh, this alliance is basically. Uh, supposed to be companies that ha have the same ideas about what they want to do with open source. So right now it's mainly uh, a tools that would uh, accommodate continuous delivery. So it's Jenkins, a lot of the plugins are in there. Uh, we have a lot of other features that are created. We have more than 30 uh, uh, repositories on GitHub under Pragma that are open source that do different kinds of things. So this is an organization that would maintain those uh, plugins and make sure that once they're created, they're also maintained and further developed. And, and if people have discussions about what features should go in there, they could actually do that in this forum. This, uh, I just want to take this back. This plugin that we have right here is uh, built by Atmo. So it's, it's, it's implemented for Atmo. It runs at Atmo. And it's uh, developed by Pragma. So it's kind of the same working model. And we hope that this is also going to... So if I'm going to do a presentation on this on a year or two, you would see a lot of names right there, right? But right now it's Atmel who's actually funding this plugin. How many of you know Atmel? They make micro microcontrollers. 
but you probably have one of their chips on you if you have a wearable device that can you know do things that probably got an Atmel chip in there so they make chips um, and uh, and they also have a tool suite a large tool suite that they offer for for as complementary for people that buy their chipset so you get an ID environment and you get drivers and JTAC uh, uh, debuggers all that stuff is it's maintained by Atmel as kind of a community and uh, so so, so this, the software developers are, are doing this uh, IDE environment. So this is what we're maintaining together with them. This is uh, this is our take and Atmos take on what continuous delivery is. It starts with the pipeline. So this is basically just trying to describe to you what it is that we're trying to achieve. So we have an idea that every commit is a potential release candidate. Now we just need to find out whether or not this particular commit is indeed a release candidate or not. So for that, we give it a ride in the continuous delivery pipeline, which is uh, basically started by something happening in the version control system, which triggers a build, which triggers a build, which triggers a build. So we, we're only actually triggered by the version control system once, and then it triggers the whole pipeline. And that might be a fat one. There's been a lot of talks about pipelines uh, today, uh, I just want to show you uh, if I can see. I have. Sorry. There it is. This is a pipeline that is. Uh, it's not the pipeline I want to show you. This is the pipeline I want to show you. This is just taking the story a little bit back again to the ClickHash UCM plugin, but this is actually available. Everybody can go and see this. It's, it's on our uh, codepragma.net slash CI. That's our Jenkins uh, environment. Everybody can look at that. Everything that we've created that's open source, people can go and browse that. Obviously, the ClickHash UCM plugin is open source, so it's there and has a pipeline. Uh, and, and, and what it does is basically it implements the drawing that you saw before. That we're, we're doing a small test here, which is kind of a Tollgate test. If this, if this uh, is successful, we are let in on the integration branch. If not, then we're basically uh, thrown away. And then the next thing we do is that we do some static code analysis, and we generate some Java documentation, and we run this... Uh, we run this very uh, comprehensive test suite that the Jaga Land Rover paid for development. So we run one hour of full test where we basically set up a Glassfish container, put Jenkins in there, throw it, our plugins in there, do a lot of tests. And when our test environment is polluted, we tear it down, set it up again, do some more testing. So we do that for a whole hour. And once we're done with that, we end up uh, generating an automated release node. And then that's a potential release candidate. If you want to go to the last column out here, then that's a political decision. Somebody needs to push the bottom. Do you want to release? Yes or no. But as a software developer, it's not my decision. It's not my call. My assignment is to create release candidates. Somebody else will release them. That's the concept. How many agree with that? Great. <laughs> that was a lot. So putting this into context, uh, it could look like this. So this is the, this is the storyline. So now we have the continuous delivery pipeline put into the context. It starts with uh, post-it notes on a whiteboard, right? We have user stories that we're working agile, somebody needs to do something. So he takes a, a post-it note off the white paper, white uh, board, and then he starts working on it. And at some point, he, he sees that it works on his computer, and he shouts, I'm done on my computer. So what he does is that he commits it into the version control system. The version control system then uh, 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 either notifies Jenkins or Jenkins will see it uh, by itself by a poll and starts the pipeline. And if any of these steps that I have implemented in my pipeline fails, then I'm not done. And if I'm done, then I have released, produced a release candidate. And then that's it. It's that easy. Right? It's, it's the only go home, do that, and you're done. So basically what happens is that you want to implement your definition of done. You don't want to describe it or document. You want to implement it. So our take is that the first step here, 
entering into the pipeline, that should be some kind of toll gate, right? Something should happen. Imagine that you uh, were contributing a, uh, an open source community like Jenkins, and you wanted to add something to the core. And there are core committers. There is a benevolent dictator and his trusted lieutenant, right? And they're guarding the, the, the core repository. If I want to make a change there, I can clone it. I can make a change. I like it. It works on my computer. I did a lot of testing. And then I'm suggesting a pull request, right? Somebody needs to take that and take it in. If they like it, I'm in. If they don't like it, I'm not in. I don't have any other options. I cannot enforce it onto the main branch. It's not my decision, right? It's the seventh principle of the Agile Manifesto. The primary measure of progress is running code. If I cannot produce running code, then you are not welcome on the master branch. That's the idea. So it's a toll gate. We want that to be completely automated. We're using a branchy approach for this. So there are many, actually, uh, technologies out there that can do this. Gary can do it. Uh, Stash can do it to some extent. There are other plugins that can do it. The ClickHase UZM plugin that we created uh, can do it in ClickHase UZM, if you're lucky enough to be there. Um, so, so we chose a branchy approach, simply because if you have uh, when you have branches to do this, what happens is that everything is contained within the repository. You don't need an ecosystem around it. All the metadata I need to make this work is available for me inside my repository. I don't need a clone that's, rep that's pushing to a clone that's pushing to a clone that's then, you know, I don't need like Team City. They have kind of a cache system. So, so if you're using Team, Team City, they would, they would kind of build a version control system inside the version control system to do that bit of, you know, uh, technology or any other, uh, uh, if you have a pull request, you have the pull request and you would rely on whatever server you have for that, GitHub or Stash or, or, or GitLab or whatever. So, so you need some kind of technology around this. So we, we, we wanted to minimize the, the, the amount of technology involved to implement this. We also have an idea that if you're on a distributed version control system, then you must have uh, you must be able to create a clone. A, a clone is a clone. It, it cannot be right that depending on which stage the clone is on, you would get a different result cloning from one or the other. So it should be contained inside the repository. How many of you, you know this drawing from Neve? Great. So, uh, so this, is, this is referred to as the Git flow or the, the successful Git uh, branching strategy. The thing is that we started out with Atmel uh, doing this, and it turns out that it's not very compliant with continuous delivery. There are several problems in here. One of the things that we saw is that Nevi is saying that every time you're about to make a release, what happens is that you would branch off to a release branch for, for you know, to simply to create order, right, and calm, and you want to stabilize the, the last two or three days before a uh, release so that nothing happens on the master. Right, so so you would have to move out of the master for four or four days, three or four days before you go back in. That is that is not you know the, the general concept of a release train where we just stay on master. What happens is that we want to stay on master. What what is on master is whatever is going into the next release. If you want to have you know a calm situation the last three or four days before a release, what you should you shouldn't deliver stuff into the master branch that shouldn't be there in the next release. You would have to have them sit there waiting on development branches, and feature branches, until you're ready to release them. That's the concept of a release train. Talking about continuous delivery and, and the whole pipeline, that also constitutes a problem because I probably have like my, maybe 10 or 15 jobs running on my master branch. So if I want to just for five days go on to another branch, I would have to provision new slaves, set up new jobs, running on new branches, all that stuff, just you know, in order to be able to, to get out of the master branch for a few days. So that's, that's not very uh, lean. That's just manual work created for people that now has to copy Jenkins jobs around. Another thing that we see as a problem is that release uh, the hotfix branches that are created. We, we don't believe in hotfixes. There's, there's only one track through recognition, and that is basically produce code that is working. There's no such thing as a, as a fast track to release. So we, we don't have uh, uh, 
hotfix branches. So all in all, we needed to come up with another, um, another um, uh, strategy. And we started by defining three different types of branches. There are only three different types. So you have the, the project integration branch, that's basically the middle. And then you have your promotion branches, branches, and that's basically everything that's beyond or above that. And then you have the development branches, and they are the ones that are contributing into your integration branch. And that's it. Any other branch would be a variant of one of these three branches. Oh, that was my phone. <laughs> um, so... Uh, A maintenance branch, basically if you have a release train, as I just described it, you have a going forward strategy. That's very popular in an open source community, right? If you have a problem, you don't, you don't go back, you just go in there and fix it, right? That's only going forward. Whenever you have a problem, you, you, you add a new release, you don't roll back. The thing is that a lot of companies cannot work with a, with a true release train strategy because sometimes they would have to do maintenance because of license issues or feature toggles or special customers or whatever. You would have to do special releases sometimes in order to accommodate a, a certain customer or, or, or some, somebody. So we have maintenance branches. And the maintenance branches, what they are, they are basically just development branches that somebody has allowed you to make a release from. But seen from the perspective of our process, the master branch and the promotion branches that are high level, you would still have eventually to deliver whatever is on your maintenance branch into master, right? To make sure that you do not reintroduce the, the, the error that you fixed or the feature that you put in there. It should be feature toggle and it should go in there. So that's the approach. Hotfix branches, we simply, we simply erase that from our vocabulary. We don't use it. We, they don't exist. It's, it's not our way of working. So the branching strategy came up with just 10 principles. Uh, the first principle is that the master branch is the continuous integration branch. That's also different from the Neve uh, 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 flow because he has, he has named his branch develop and then he uses master for his, his master releases. But we, we stay on master and say master, that's the default name for this purpose in Git, so we, we stick with that. Um, that was, uh, that was that one, they're related. All integration should be automated. So basically what we advocate, and we actually did that in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Atmo, they're using Stash as their repository browser. We put a trigger on Stash that's saying that anybody who pushes anything onto Stash that would manipulate the content of master is not committed, is not let in. So you have no means actually of, of producing stuff onto a master except actually producing a bit of code that works. And then it's automatically integrated. Only trivial merges are uh, allowed on to master, uh, but, but any trivial merge is allowed. So as long as it can be merged without human interference, it's let in. And then we hope that if that th is not you know, right in the context, then there will be some kind of test, unit test, functional test, uh, deployment test, anything. If that's not okay, then it will be caught in a test later. But we don't want to have manual merges. The, manual, the only manual merges that we have that requires human interventions, that would be when a developer needs to uh, synchronize with the master branch. And he would do that on his own development branch. And then that's you know, his call. But all merges are automated. Every successful integration onto the master branch kicks off a pipeline. So every commit deserves a write in the pipeline. So it's, like, it's not like that we're accumulating like four or five or six commits and then we pull it off because I need, actually, I need to actually give every single commit onto, onto the master branch its own write through the pipeline in order to be able to say if something goes wrong, I need to be able to point it back to that particular commit, not that group of commits. So it's actually started every time that something happens. And this is about, uh, you know, criticize 
uh, criticizing the, the release strategy in, in, in Neva, basically saying that we don't, we don't do that. We have a release train. So, so the next release is always, always whatever is on master. If something is not supposed to go into the next release, then somebody is supposed to do a subtractive merge from master because it will go into the next release if it is on master. So keep it out of there if not, if not relevant. Any push to the centralized repository that contains a branch with a certain name, a secret name, a magic name that I'll show you in a minute how we set that up. Every branch that contains, uh, that matches this uh, naming convention will be integrated onto master. Sometimes we want to have, uh, we can have nested hierarchies, so it's not necessary that all development branches are actually delivering into master. I can have a development branch devel delivering into a another development branch, which basically then would be a team branch. Right, so you know the concept of team branches and feature branches, and there are many different types of branches. Basically, what we're saying here is that we allow that. You can have any set of branches that you want in your own context. We just automate the rest. And they're all automated. So once you have, once you have reached the master branch, the rest is automated as well. So if you use more branches for promotion, you can have one called tested, one called stable, one called uh, release. I don't know how many promotion branches you would like to have, but any of these are also uh, automated. Once you want to automate onto the promotion branches, we have the rule that they can only come from one contributing source. So basically what happens is that master will merge onto stable, stable will merge onto published or, or released or whatever. You can't have both stable and master go in there. What we achieve by this is that we're guaranteed that any merge we want to automate beyond master is fast forwarded, always, because there's always one contributor. So basically the, the, the promotion branches will start behaving almost as if they were just floating uh, labels on the master branch. This is our revised picture of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the flow. I, it's not very clear here, but you can come to a booth and pick it up. I got, I got these uh, small, you can, you can grab them and take them home and put them on, and I maybe want to do them big, you can do a poster. Uh, the thing is that everything that happens from the orange line and to the right is automated. And every level of freedom that you could possibly think of on your development branches is maintained. So you get the best of two worlds. Developers can do whatever they want to do with Git. It's their choice. They can do anything they want, any structure. But we control the level of quality. So uh, you see, this is actually just... Uh, so what happens is that if I deliver something in here, it, it, it would go into the master branch, and that would then be the head of the master branch. And I could do that several times. Maybe later in my pipeline, I have a job that would promote the master branch to stable. It obviously uh, runs further down in the pipeline. For that purpose alone, it would run uh, later. Uh, so I might have several uh, commits into my master branch before my stable is updated, because if I want to run a full functional test and, and uh, deployment before I, I, I ship that to stable, that might run for a few hours. So it will be at least a few hours late. But what happens is that since they're all promoted from the same source, which originally is master, it means that all the branches that I can put on will eventually turn up basically as, uh, as commits on the master branch. So there is only one branch. This is a true, genuine release train. And again, out here, I would normally work uh, in a setup that is represented by just those two branches. This is just an example of saying that if somebody allows it, I could put release and, uh, and uh, stable uh, uh, branch tags uh, on, on this branch if I wanted to, but I would, I would have to name them slightly different, right? So I would ha have to name them stable for blah, blah, or release for blah, blah, because there's only one stable and there's only one release and they're on master. The idea that Admiral has, what they want to do, what we're doing right now, so we have implemented this, and the next step that we're doing to, together with them is that if anybody wants to work on a development branch, 
he would, we would like to have that all the, all the jobs that represent the pipeline on master, if I go on another branch, I would like those jobs, those jobs to follow with me, right? So basically, I want uh, some kind of technology saying that if I produce a branch that has a certain name, it would, uh, it would, uh, it would, I'm running out of time, I can see that. Uh, it would, uh, it would simply spin off new jobs and, and set that up automatically. And once I merge, merge that back in, it would just uh, close those jobs back again. So, so we're implementing that for, for, for Atmo. This is the Git plugin, as you know it. And the only th so we re utilize the Git plugin. And basically, the only thing that's really interesting is the branch specifier. Everything is just business as usual from your point. So the branch specifier is telling you what is the branch, the naming convention that we subscribe to. So in here, I have put the, that we are subscribing to branches named origin slash anything. So if you push a branch that's called origin slash anything, it will be integrated. And this is the plugin. There's nothing more than that. So basically, I just turn on the plugin. I, I say that I want to integrate into master. I have to choose from one or two uh, uh, strategies for, for doing that. And then um, that's it. I'm integrated. So basically, it takes off where the SCM plugin stops. It will, uh, the SCM will, will, will be triggered by the ready branch. I will go and switch that back to the master branch. And then I will take the ready branch and integrate it. And I will deliver that workspace to the build process. The build process will then work, run. If it likes what, what's in there, it will actually commit it in the end. If it doesn't like it, it will do nothing. Right? It will just fail the build. So if it works, I'm in. If it doesn't work, I'm not let in. That is available out there. Um. I think I lost my connection here. Okay. So this gives me the ability to say that I, I, I said before that we have all levels of freedom that that the maintained in the development branches that we want. So basically. If I want to use my centralized repository, I sometimes want to use it for sharing code with my colleagues. So if I'm on a branch and, uh, and uh, I'm leaving for a vacation and I would like one of my colleagues to take over whatever on my branch is not done, but I need to share it with him. And I need, I need to, if I'm going through Garrett or anything, I mean, sometimes it can be a problem actually using a centralized repository like that if, if there is a, a rule for how to set this up. But our rule is basically that if I'm not matching the naming convention, I can do anything. So I can have my local branch called my dev, and I can work on that, and I can push it as often as I want to to my centralized repository. Nothing happens. When I'm done and I like what I see, I just basically have to switch name on the branch as I push it. So I can push it with a command like this. This is basically the technology saying that if I'm ready and I'm pushing, I'm switching the name. I don't know if you know this syntax in Git, but what it says is that, that I am, it says Git pushed to a region, my dev, de my dev, and on the region, it will become ready slash case 167. So I, I switch the name, and that will trigger the integration. But I still have my dev branch on my own local clone, so I can continue to work on that, actually, if I want to. The the swash commit and the accumulated commits are 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 basically what we're trying to do here is that we want to make it easy for people to collaborate, and if I have a case 167 and I've been working with that, so typically a typical scenario for a software developer is that I I go and take that white uh, post-it note off the wall and I start working on it, and then I have something that I think might work, and then I commit that, and then it didn't work. And then I figure out what was wrong, and then I do some more work, and then I think it's working, and then it's still not working. And then I might have you know, two or three shots at it before it's actually done. So now I want to deliver that to my colleague, maybe for a peer review. So instead of actually having him to review my four review, uh, commits, or asking him to review my accumulated commits, because I have uh, spread across four commits, 
a, a good habit among developers is that they squash their commits before they deliver it. How many of you do that? Squash your commits and git before you deliver it. Well, you don't need to do that anymore because our plugin will do it for you. Basically, what happens is that we do not allow commits that are not uh, represented by just one single identifiable commit. So this means that any, any, just any normal merge would try to do a fast forward if it could. But a fast forward, I'll show you later, that can be quite dangerous because history information might actually be lost give it, uh, because you're basically just switching your head. You're not creating any new commits. So, so, uh, so what we want is we want to make sure that the things that you, the, the commits, th the changes that you are actually delivering, they are identifiable in just one single commit. There are two different ways that you can do that. You can merge using fast forward, no fast forward. So basically you're saying to Git that even though you could fast forward this one, you're not allowed to, so you will create a new uh, uh, commit. Or you can do, uh, you can merge squash. So you can squash it, and what happens there is basically that, that all your commits are squashed into your workspace, but they're actually not committed, so you can work, continue to work with them. So, so that's kind of a, a, a composite uh, 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 command there. So we're, we're doing a merge squash, and then we're doing a commit. But then that's, that's basically uh, uh, this, the, uh, the same thing. You get up with the same results that you have one commit representing all your changes. If you allow me to, to go a little nitty-gritty uh, on the differences between squashed and, and, uh, and, and no fast-forward and uh, just a plain vanilla merge. So this is, a, this is a, a, an accumulated strategy. It's, it's created with, the, with, the, with the no fast-forward. Imagine that we have the same offset on master branch, and I have a branch called dev, and I do make two changes out there. At the same time, I have another developer who's fixing something. He has a branch called fix, and he's also doing two commits, right? So I want those to be accumulated into master when I deliver it. This is done by giving the, it the, uh, the no fast forward uh, 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 flag. And this is uh, basically just a dump of the git show dash branch commands. Do you, how many of you know this command, show branch? Basically, what it does is it can show you the branches that you have in your clone. And, and uh, so these, the information here is basically the, what you see above here is that I have three heads. I have three branches in my, in my Git clone. I have a master, I have a fix, and I have a dev. And, and what I see below the, the, the line here is basically all the commits that I have in my, um, in my repository. And then they have markings, right? So this one... Is actually uh, so dev branch contains these three, and uh, and uh, master contains all of these, and fix contains just this one and this one and this one. So these are, are the two commits created on dev. These are the two commits created on fix, and then they're integrated. Okay, this might be a little bit confusing. How can a commit actually belong to more than one branch? But in Git, that's quite common. Uh, you can take just the offset here, right? I had my offset in master, and then I create a new branch on that called dev, and I create a new branch on that called fix. So now that commit is actually contained in three branches going forward. Now, this is interesting because I do have an identifier for my delivery of dev, and I do have an identifier for my delivery of, of, my, of my fix. Uh, but I also have another problem. How many of you know the bisect function in Git. Cool. How many of you use it? Okay. But it's, it's really cool because you can, you can actually, it can do a lot of work for you. Imagine that you would run a bisect, if you were on master, this is your head, and you would run a bisect between this commit and this commit, then it would actually visit all of your commits. Which is conceptually not potentially what you wanted, because you have an idea that this commit here was not on uh, the master branch, it was on the dev branch, this one is on the master branch. So conceptually, Git is not totally aligned with you what's actually happened, right? You can identify the commits, for, but, but, but it, a bicep will still do way too much work, because it would actually go into the development branches and actually try to, 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 uh, to verify them as well. Bisect, for those who don't, doesn't know it, is basically that you have you can automate a process where you say from this commit to this commit 
I have this commit, and I have a test that I'm running, and I like it, it's good, it's working. I can identify a commit down here where the same test is not working. And then Bisect will automatically go into and, and do basically a, 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 a quick sort and try to figure out what, what is the first commit that was introduced that introduced the error that would fail your test. You can do that automatically. And, and it, it runs like four or five, seven commits, and that's independent of how many commits you're actually testing. So even if you have thousands of commits, it will only r run like you know seven or eight tests and find your commit. It's pretty impressive. It's a nice feature. Now, this is what happens if I'm using squashed uh, setup. So if I'm using it the squashed way, I get basically exactly what I want, right? So I have, uh, I have uh, the same offset, I have dev, I have a uh, fix, and I have one representing dev and one representing fix. So if I would start my bisect here from this, it would only visit the two commits that are actually uh, the one that I conceptually mean are contained on the master branch. So it's obvious that we have chosen the squashed strategy to be our, our, uh, our, uh, our default value. This is what happens if you do plain vanilla. If you do not use neither no fast forward and you do not use uh, um, uh, squashed, what happens here is that somewhere at this point here, I actually merged master onto uh, my uh, dev branch. But that was a fast forward. So the only thing I got from that was actually that my master head was stepped up to that commit. But later in the process, I'm merging master again. So now I'm moving my master head another place, right? I never actually created a new commit representing my integration of dev. I just fast forwarded my, 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 my head. So eventually when I go back, this is my dev delivery. It's not very obvious. It's not very easy to find. In the big chip picture, that information is just basically lost. So if, if you want to do branches as you, in Git as you, want, as, you, as you do it in any of the old school branching system, like ClearCase or Perforce or Subversion, if that is your notion of branches, then you should be very careful about merging stuff into master using fast forward mergers, because the history might get lost. And also here, if I would run a bisect, I would basically run on everything. Not very interesting. So why wouldn't you then use squashed commits always? Yeah, well, you will. But <laughs> yes. So okay. If you want to, if you want to separate test from from implementation, for instance. So if they are they if these are not related. But th there might obviously be uh, some situations where you, where you can, but we have still given the developer all the level of freedom that he wanted. So you can actually you can go and do your own branches, you can do your own cherry picking, you can rewrite your own history in your own clone, you can do anything you want, and then when you're ready, you deliver that. So basically, splitting uh, four or five or six commits up in two different uh, deliveries, even a uh, long time after you actually did that, is still possible because you can go into your own Git clone and make those branches and make those cherry picks and then deliver them one by one. You can do that. You have every level of freedom maintained as a Git developer or a Git user. But, but have a look at actually what's happened, the way that we're squashing it. So I'm not rewriting my history. What I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not squashing my own history. I'm using the squashed switch, switch to the merge command, which is slightly different. So I'm actually maintaining, I'm maintaining the history. So the history about that there were originally five you know, developers uh, contributing to this particular commit, that is maintained because I, I'm not really removing the fixed branch. So if you're not either, then that information is still actually accessible. Yeah. 
So let me show you how it works in uh, in uh, in real life. So 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 how this works in uh, if I can. So maybe you're right, but um, let me see if if I can convince you that that this is not as. Uh, You're free to ask questions, right? We have five more minutes, and just throw me questions if you want to do uh, if you want to do uh, more demos than I can do in the next four minutes. Uh, please come to our booth, and we can do any of the demos that you want to see. If you're very very disappointed because this presentation was not on ClearCase UZM, then you can <laughs> then <laughs> then you can come to the booth, and I will happily show you the ClearCase UZM as a plugin as well. Okay. <laughs> So, say for instance that I have, uh, so sorry, um, I, th I, I think I might accidentally actually have shut down my notes here. This is typically what it could look like. This is this is a build that is actually running this uh, plugin. Uh, so what is from the from the front? What we have done is that it says that we successfully integrated uh, origin ready pre-tested block, pre-tested block, pre-tested block. The point is here. I can actually reuse the names, right? Every time I push to 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 something, the, the, there are no rules that I cannot re reuse my names. The only rules that are is that if I name it ready, then it's integrated. If I don't, then I don't touch it, right? But I can reuse any name I want to use. So that might be helpful if you want to do more commits, right? Okay, I can basically just do one. I can branch off for one for, 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 uh, from one point and then commit that, and then I can do the, the, the head of the same branch later, and that would turn up as two commits. If I go into my configure of this particular one, oh, this is I'm quite slow. There it is. I'm not getting much internet. There it is. So again, this is this is the interesting part. Th you don't shouldn't be alarmed at this. This is just because I'm using uh, credentials none. I have installed the SSH keys on the slave, but this is actually passed by the master, and the master have no idea how to communicate with that GitHub. Uh, set up, so that's why I get the error. I won't get the error when I actually run it because it's the master that's running it, not the sorry, the slave that's running it. So please ignore the red uh, text there. This is the interesting part. This is the strategy. This is my contract with my developers. This is how I set up my job. We agree that any branch that is that is prefixed with the keyword ready, that's the one that's interesting. If you would rather have uh, 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 another naming convention, this is where you set it up. If you want to, if you want to do multiple levels, so if you want to do it from master to stable, whatever, then you can say if you if you can basically say anything on master should go on to stable, and then I would just have another job lifting it the next step, right? So basically, just one step. So it's also a queue that's being executed here. If I go down down to one to to our plugin, you see this is basically just what I what I showed you. This is this is where our plugin turns up. It has Git. I go on to master, I use squash commit, and then it will basically uh, just do the integration. For this particular plugin that we're in, it is... This is a web page that is running GitHub pages, so I can build it locally with, the, with, the, with, with Jekyll. Something like this. So this is my local clone, right? So what I have done here is that basically when I have pushed something up to Git, I can go back onto my local clone and I can fetch, uh, because I will push to my region and Jenkins, the Jenkins slave will look at the same region. So the Jenkins slave will then take a clone onto the slave 
do its thing, and if it successfully integrates it, it will delete the branch. If it doesn't integrate it, it will let the branch hang out there for you to go back and scrutinize and see what went wrong. But if it's successfully integrated, I'll just delete the branch, and then I'll push that back into a region. So when I actually uh, uh, when I, uh, uh, fetch stuff or pull stuff from a region, I actually get the work that the Jenkins uh, slave uh, created for me. So, so this is my local clone, and I actually see that that this is the standard message that we produce. Every time we integrate something successfully, we basically just put the commit message there saying that we successfully integrated a region-ready pre-tested log. So that's it. So it's self-contained. The information that is, uh, my colleagues are producing by pushing to a region is all uh, processed by, uh, by, by the Jenkins slave, and when I fetch, I get that same information. What we're hoping, I'm done, right? So what we're hoping is that you want to use this plugin and you want to wear it and you want to see where it doesn't work and you want to report that, potentially go into the, to the Joshua website or the, the, the plugin website um, uh, and contribute. But this is how we're working. This is what we do at Pragma. Uh, we help people set up their continuous delivery tool stacks and if they need a plugin, we'll create it for them. The plugins that we have on Jenkins right now have more than 2,000 installations together, and they are spread across 13 plugins, I think. And they're all developed this way. Questions? So... This is git show branch. And then I want to be... Uh, there is a... There is a... Uh, I need to use the... EDD. I forgot what his name is. There is th in order to see the sparse, is it? Yeah. Yes, I did. I only have two branches in my uh, in my, but but it because it allows me, I can clean up. Once I have you know the branches, when I commit and I see okay, it successfully integrated my branch, I can see my pipeline is kicked off. I'm done. I'm truly done, right? It's the definition of done. If I'm integrated, I'm in. I can delete the branch. That's it.